According to legend, in an obscure cemetery in Pennsylvania, there exists a gravestone from the 1800s upon which is inscribed the following epitaph, and it reads, Remember, friend, when passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. An interesting poetic sentiment. However, it seems that at some point over the years, some anonymous passerby felt moved to offer his comment on this. For on this same gravestone, scratched beneath the epitaph, are these words. Dear friend, to follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Following into death, knowing which way we're going. We know which way Jesus went in death. Will we follow him? A great theologian once said that when Christ calls a person, he bids them come and die. Seemingly very strange statement. But the point being that dying with Christ and his spiritually sharing in his death is, is central to our faith, central to life in Jesus Christ. That the way to Easter, the way to life, the only way is through Good Friday. It's the way Jesus went. If you truly want to follow him into the fullness of life he offers, the life that he, he longs for you to have, you have to go there. Simply put, if you don't die, you can't rise. Sadly, however, this is exactly the fundamental disconnect that most plagues the church today. It is, in fact, the constant struggle of the Christian faith in all times, people seeking to rise without dying. And thus, just like the absurdity of such an idea itself, our faith is often ultimately equally absurd, meaningless, empty. It just doesn't work. You can't get there from here. When Christ calls a person, he bids them come and die. So how do we do this? What does it mean to share in Christ's death, to spiritually die with Christ, that we might truly rise to life with him? This is our topic this morning. Today on this Palm Sunday, as we celebrate our Savior's joyful arrival in Jerusalem, greeted by the adoring crowds, waving palm branches, to begin his final week of ministry, the, the week in which the events of our salvation are played out, as we begin this week, we arrive at the conclusion of our Lenten sermon series on Jesus' words from the cross with his final statement, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. A statement that works on, on many levels. First of all, it, it's a prayer. It's a word to the Father. As we know at the outset of this series, Jesus' time on the cross is framed by prayer, like bookends, modeling for us the way through any painful and terrifying time. It's through prayer. A reminder to us that one of the most basic ways every single one of us can improve our lives right now, no matter where we are in the journey of faith, whether we're brand new to it or a, or a long-time disciple, is by working on deepening our connection with God, making prayer a constant part of our lives, always talking over everything with the Lord, everything that we're going through. You know, thinking about St. Patrick's Day this past week, it's like the old Irish proverb that says, every day you should get down on your knees and thank the Lord that you're still on your feet. Right? You know, make that connection. Make that connection. So Jesus' words here are, first of all, a prayer. In this, though, they are also a quotation of Scripture. Once again, you know, as we've noted a, a number of times in this series, many of Jesus' words from the cross are biblical references. And this one today is from Psalm 31, verse 5, which, interestingly, was a verse that was traditionally taught by mothers to their children as a bedtime prayer. Much as we today might teach our children, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. So in Jesus' day, children were taught, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's a prayer of safekeeping and trust while in sleep. As one scholar remarks, even on the cross, Jesus died like a child falling asleep in his father's arms. The phrase, I commit or I commend, depending on your translation, even reinforcing this as it is an, it's an ancient uh, banking term that refers to money entrusted to another for safekeeping. In effect, in this seventh word from the cross, Jesus proclaims his profound trust, a truly perfect childlike trust that he can enter into death confidently, a confidence he possesses, but also it seems he is demonstrating it's available to any who place their lives in his. Again, a faith that he is modeling for us here. So there are many things going on in this prayer, uh, scripture, confidence, but ultimately, of course, beyond all of this, this is simply Jesus' final word. That is, with this statement, he literally gives up the ghost and enters into death. And this, I believe, is the main thing he's about here. He's showing us how he enters into death. And in his words, spoken as much, if not more, for us as for him, 
showing us the way to follow, the way into sharing in his death. What do we learn? Well, a few thoughts on spiritually dying with Christ, the only way to truly live with him. First, dying with Christ involves a decision. Jesus says, you know, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Notice those, those, those two words, I commit. Think about what they tell us right off the top. They tell us that this is not something that is just sort of happening to Jesus, something beyond his control. Rather, that it is something that Jesus chooses to do, a conscious decision. I commit, that is, I hand over, I do this. Understand, in his death on the cross, life is not taken from Jesus. Rather, he gives it on our behalf. As God himself, it can't be taken from him. He can only offer it, which he does. As Jesus even said elsewhere, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. In other words, having come to the final stages of his work, you know, as we noted last week, you know, it is finished. This then reinforced in our text today where we're told, you know, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This being the curtain in the sanctuary that separated the worshipers from the holy of holies, the place where God was understood to dwell. It's tearing, representing the barrier between humanity and God, which, which is sin, now being removed in Christ's death. God and humanity united in Christ, reunited. So Jesus now completes the saving work by taking on the death that is the cost of that sin, that barrier. He chooses to die. Jesus makes his entry into death through a choice, a conscious decision. And this is where it must begin for us as well if we are to follow. But this is exactly the first major stumbling block, the first thing that is so often missing. Just think about, back to those two words again. I commit. These may well be the two of the most frightening words in the English language. They certainly seem to be the most despised words in, in our world today. No one, no one commits to anything anymore. Everything is a maybe, a possibly. I'll get back to you on that, you know? Let's face it, no real commitments, you know? No definite choices, no firm decisions. If you don't believe me, just try something as simple as, say, throwing a party and asking people to RSVP and see what percentage actually respond, you know? And that's for something that's fun, right? Total fear of commitment. And what do we get for it? Is life now all wonderful and rosy and better? Or is it worse than ever? So busy trying to make sure that we can back out of things if, we, if they don't go the way we like or if we find a better deal that we fail to realize is, is that what we thus wind up with is, is a whole bunch of nothing. Just think of your own life. Are not all the things of real value to you the things that you've had to make a real commitment to? your marriage, uh, your family, your education, uh, your job. Great things only come about through great commitments. Well, the same is true of the life of faith. Many people nowadays are trying to just back their way into salvation. They want to just hang around Jesus, hoping some good will rub off. And yes, hanging out with the Lord will result in some good rubbing off on you, but it is nowhere near the good that God can work and longs to work in your life today. Let's be honest. Most Christians today have a stronger commitment to their cell phone than they do to the Lord. Right? You can see the faithful, the faithful everywhere worshiping at their altars. Right? You know, we will sign a contract with Verizon, but we will not sign one with the Lord. And then we wonder why we suffer. Make no mistake, dying with Christ that we might truly live with Him only begins with a decision, a clear, conscious choice. A noted preacher puts it this way. He writes. Millions of Christians nowadays live in a sentimental haze of vague piety with soft organ music trembling in the lovely light from stained glass windows. Their religion is a pleasant thing of emotional quiver, far divorced from the will and demanding little except lip service to a few harmless platitudes. I suspect that Satan has called off his attempt to convert people to disbelief. After all, if a person travels far, far enough away from Christianity, he or she is in danger of seeing in perspective and deciding that it actually is true. It is much safer from Satan's point of view to vaccinate a person with a mild case of Christianity so as to protect him from the real disease. So nearby, just never really devoting yourself to it. Dying with Christ only begins with a decision. And simply put, have you ever made a conscious, clear conscious choice to give your life to Christ? And do you continually, every day, make that decision? Understand, such a decision is not simply once for all. Rather, it's something that must be constant and repeated every day, every moment. Lord, I commit my life to you. Have you ever, have you ever made that decision, but perhaps have drifted from it and need to return to it? Have you never made that decision, and you need to do it today? 
Don't settle for a mild taste of Christianity. Insist on the real thing. Commit. You ever heard the old story about the country preacher whose sermon one Sunday was about the gift of heaven for those in Christ? Well, after about an hour of very enthusiastic preaching about eternal bliss and the, you know, the joys awaiting each person on the other side, the old preacher paused for effect and asked, how many of you here want to go to heaven? And all hands were raised except for one man sitting in the front pew. Seeing that he still had this one hold out, the preacher launched into another 30 minutes of fire and brimstone preaching, at which point he asked again, how many here want to go to heaven? Once again, the same response, all but one. So the preacher tried another 15 minutes. He really went at it. He, he pulled out all the stops. One more time, same question, same response. Finally exasperated at this one man's obstinacy, the old preacher left the pulpit. He came down to, to directly face the man in the pew. Mr. The minister asked, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Somewhat taken aback, the man replied, oh, oh, yes, preacher, I, I want to go to heaven when I die. It's just that, well, the way you've been carrying, I thought you were trying to get a load to go right now. <laughs> we all want what Christ has to offer just as long as we don't have to commit to it right now. It doesn't work that way. Dying with Christ first begins with a decision. From this then, secondly, it requires a surrender. Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit. He, he, he lets go of his life. He, he hands it over. Now, obviously, as we've known in the past, Jesus, Jesus is God. So in handing his spirit over to God, what that represents is God in Christ, God's surrender of his life into death. And again, the, the words here are almost more for us. They're pointing the way that this is what is next required. Jesus is saying, to let go of your life and to place it into God's hands. Sharing in Christ's crucifixion, crucifixion, secondly, requires letting go and placing your life entirely in the Lord's hands. And this asks of each of us, what part of my life have I not placed in God's hand? What within me won't I let go of? What persists? You know, it's, always, it's off limits to God, and it's keeping me from truly dying with Christ that I might really rise with him. What sin? What fear? What selfishness? What comfort? What grudge, what prejudice, what need to control? You know what? The great preacher, Pastor Henry Nouwen, once wrote the following reflection in his diary. He wrote, I love Jesus, but I want to hold on to my own friends even when they lead me away from the Lord. I love Jesus, but I want to hold on to my own independence even when it brings me no real freedom. I love Jesus, but do not want to lose the respect of my colleagues even though the respect does not make me grow spiritually. I love Jesus, but I do not want to give up my writing, travel, and speaking plans, even when they are often more to my glory than to God's. I love Jesus, but... And I don't know about you, but I can really relate to that. I love Jesus. There's so many other things, things that often actually lead me away from him, that sometimes even make things worse for me, actually hurt me, things that I continually fight to let go of that I don't want to hand over to him because I'm afraid of, of what he might make of them. And thus, they keep me from life. I love Jesus, but, you know, you know, it has been said that the true measure of faith is not what you give up, but what you hold back. In dying with Christ, ask, what today am I holding back? What won't I place in God's hands? Jesus, Jesus held back nothing. To die with him, we must be willing to do the same. Grammy-winning singer Lauren Hill writes, There was a point when I decided that I wasn't going to pray anymore. I stopped praying because there were some things in my life that I knew weren't good for me. But I had decided that I needed those things. I knew that if I prayed, God would take them away from me. So I was afraid. I was devastatingly terrified of prayer. But one night, I slipped. I prayed, and just like I expected, God went right after all those things I didn't want him to have. But much to my surprise, he took them all, made something better of my life than I thought there could ever be. I handed everything over, and in a snap, he loosened my tongue, and a creative voice just came and sang. Dying with Christ secondly requires a surrender. What part of you are you refusing to place into God's hand? Which, which part of you are you sort of holding back? Is it something in your marriage? Is it something in your family? 
Is there something in a dream you've had that you fought off? Whatever, you know. What are you refusing to hand over? Which leads us into thirdly, dying with Christ demands a rebirth. In all of this, of course, dying obviously marks the end of one life. And as we noted last week, one thing ending implies that something new, some new thing has begun. This idea being even reinforced in the word commit in our text today, which is noted as a banking term that refers to money placed in, safe, in safekeeping, specifically to be returned at a later date. In other words, life ends, but life will return. New life will return. The third concept here is that dying in Christ demands rebirth. You have to be willing to be reborn, to start a new life, to, to hand yourself over, and to be made new. How often is this the third thing that, that keeps us from dying and rising in Christ? That we simply don't want to really be made new, to be changed. We just want a little help with our lives, not a complete makeover. It's another, it's another one, you know, one of those old church words that's fallen out of favor, you know, conversion, right? We don't want personal conversion. We just want a little sprucing up. We talk about spirituality, whatever it is, not conversion. But conversion's where it's at, you know? What's the old saying? We all always want everything to be better, just so long as nothing changes. Right? It's true, right? Well, it just doesn't work that way. How are you fighting God, making you new, really changing your life, and who you are? Author, pastor, and one-time atheist, Lee Strobel, he says this in one of his sermons. How can I tell you the difference God has made in my life? Well, my daughter Allison was five years old when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, and all she had ever known in those five years was a dad who was profane and angry. I remember I came home one night, and I kicked a hole in the living room wall just out of my anger with life. I am ashamed to think of how many times Allison hid in, hid in her room to get away from me. Five months after I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that little girl went to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. At age five. What was she saying? She'd never studied theology. All she knew was her dad used to be this way, hard to live with, but more and more her dad was becoming this way, loving and gentle and kind. And if that's what God does for people, well, then sign her up. At age five, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Would that we all felt the same. God changed my family. He changed my world. He changed my eternity. You know when God has truly come into your life because you change. It has been said that God is in the transformation business. God took the worst thing that man could do to his son and transformed it into the best thing he could do for man. You have to be willing to be transformed, not just helped, but changed. How are you fighting this today? Dying with Christ, thirdly, demands a rebirth. And then finally, fourth, it results in defiance. In the end, as Jesus hands his life over, I like the way one scholar reflects on this. He writes, For the past 15 to 18 hours, Jesus had been in the hands of brutal people. With their hands, they had whipped him. With their hands, they beat him. With their hands, they slapped him. With their hands, they abused him. With their hands, they jammed a crown of thorns on him, and with their hands, they nailed him to a cross. But now his life was no longer in their hands. Rather, his life was now in the tender hands of God's love, and there, it, there is where he would stay. Once again, the words here are for us, the final point. To die with Christ is to understand your life as no longer being in control, in, in control, controlled by sinful hands, but now in God's hands, and you die to anything that says otherwise. That is, you finally quit living your life like your life is being held by sinful, broken creation. You defy that other life in favor of life in Christ. In effect, you finally take hold of all this by continually remembering who now holds you. Into your hands, Lord, I commit myself. The final question in dying with Christ. How is God calling you today to defy the grasp of sinful, broken creation in, in favor of his embrace? That is, to forgive, though the world says to hate. To rejoice, though your heart says to be sad. To hope, though the devil says to despair. To embrace, though sin says pull back. To dream, though evil says give up. Dying in Christ is finally embodied in remembering whose hands you are in and defying anything that claims otherwise. Christian author Tim Brown, in his book, I Can Do All Things Through Christ, writes, I've been around college students a long time, and you can't help but have your favorites. One of my favorites was a kid named Ted Vanderveen from Spring Lake, Michigan. Tall, with curly hair and a smile as broad as the dawn, he was a charmer and a great student. 
He graduated from Hope College in the early 90s and took a job at Johnson Controls. He scurried up the ladder of success about as quickly as anybody can, and that is until a, a raw-boned, wind-whipped November afternoon. I was sitting in my office, and my secretary told me Ted Vanderveen was on the line. He's a friend, so I was eager to talk with him. I said, hey, Ted, how you doing? A weak, trembling voice said, I'm not doing so good. I said, what's up? He said, I'm in the hospital in Grand Rapids. I've got the flu or something. My folks are out of the country. I said, I'm going to be in Grand Rapids later today. Maybe I can stop by and see you. Would, you, would that be OK? And he said, I'd like that a lot. By the time I got to Ted, the doctors had already gotten to him. It wasn't the flu. It was leukemia. And that began a three-year arduous battle that he would lose or win, maybe. Now come with me to room 5255 Butterworth Hospital. They call it Spectrum Health now. I, I walked into the room, and Ted was lying on his side. They had positioned the pillows between his skinny little legs. His hair wasn't curly anymore. There wasn't enough energy for him to look at me, so I, I got down on one knee so I could look at him eyeball to eyeball. I said, hi, Ted. He said, hi, Tim. There was this, this long, awkward pause. I, I've been a pastor for 20 years, and I still, I still didn't know what to say. He broke the silence. He said, I've learned something. Now, I know this much, at least. You, you don't trifle with the words of a person who is about to die. You just listen carefully. So I said, well, tell me, what have you learned? He said, I've learned that life is not like a videotape. Now, I didn't get it any more than you're getting it now. So I said, I don't get it. What do you mean? He said, life is not like a videotape. You can't fast forward to the bad parts. Long pause. I'm thinking to myself, where does he get this stuff? Then he interrupts the silence again to say, but I have learned that Jesus Christ is in every frame, and that's enough. Jesus is in every frame, and that's enough. It was enough when his parents rocked that little baby at the waters of baptism that Jesus Christ would be in the frame. It was enough when he toddled off to first grade that Jesus Christ would be in the frame. It was enough when he turned his tassel toward an uncertain hope, at, at, an uncertain future at Hope College that Jesus Christ would be in that frame. And it would be enough when he breathed his last here and his first there that Jesus Christ should be in the frame. Ted smiled at me and I at him. He was defying the claim that broken creation was trying to get over him, and God was meeting him there with life. Because he had died with Christ, death could not get a hold of him. He knew whose hands he was in. How is God calling you today to defy sinful, broken creation all around you and in you and instead die to life in him? The story is told of a Sunday school teacher who once wanted to explain to the six-year-olds in her class that it is purely through faith in Jesus Christ and not our good works that a person is able to go to heaven. In an attempt to first discover what the kids already believed about the subject, he asked a few questions. If I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all the money to the poor, he asked, would that get me into heaven? No, the children answered. The, preacher was, the teacher was encouraged. Well, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? Again, the answer was no. The teacher was thrilled. Well, then, if I was kind to animals and gave candy to all the children and loved my wife, would that get me into heaven? Again, they all shouted no. Well, then. The teacher asked, looking out over his class, how can I get to heaven? A boy in the back row immediately stood up and shouted, it's simple, you got to be dead. Right? Right? you got to be dead. Right? you got to be dead to receive everything Christ offers, all the life he offers, all the life he longs for you to have. you first got to die. You've got to spiritually die with him. Do you want a fantastic marriage, an amazing family, real fulfillment in your work, an overwhelming sense of purpose and meaning, confidence in all circumstances, and profound personal worth? Well, how do you have some dying to do? When Christ calls a person, he bids them come and die. This holy week, make it truly holy. Enable something to really happen. Journey to the cross and die with Christ there that you might rise with him. Our Savior's final words from the cross, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Decision, surrender, rebirth, 
defiance. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 419 in the red hymnal, I Am Thine, O Lord. Would you please stand?